Today's episode has been made possible by Blinkist, an app designed for those who love to read but don't necessarily have an abundance of time. The first hundred people to visit Blinkist.com slash mythology and fiction will get unlimited access for an entire week as well as a 25% discount. Stick around until the end to find out more about today's great offer. Vampires are everywhere. You pick up a book, vampire. You turn on the TV, vampire. You take a walk outside to get away from it all, and, well, creepy guy down the road who thinks he's a vampire. Wherever you are in the world, it's likely you've heard stories and legends of a vampire-like creature. With such a rich history to explore, it's fair to ask, where did vampires come from? And why are we so obsessed with them? The word vampire conjures numerous images, from Nosferatu and Christopher Lee's Dracula, to latex wearing goths with guns, whatever these are meant to be, and even glittering abominations we'd all like to pretend never existed. What we see in pop culture has certainly been influenced by the legends of old, and those are what we will focus on today. Before the 18th century, the term vampire never really existed. Much like the hysteria surrounding the witch trials, a series of odd disappearances, weird markings on corpses, and suspicious activities around graveyards and cemeteries led to accusations of vampirism. The majority of these reports came from the Balkans and Eastern Europe, with each country and region having its own iteration of what we would consider a vampire. Some of the oldest examples worldwide include figures such as Lamastu, Lilith, Lamia, and the Impusa, who are all female, but they aren't necessarily the undead creatures you'd associate with vampires. They're more demon or succubus-like. In Romania and other parts of Eastern Europe, you have tales of the Strigoi, spirits who had risen from the grave who could only survive through the blood of others. If needed, they could turn invisible and transform into animals. Not too different from today's vampires who can transform into bats and other creatures. Variations of the word strigoi can be found in numerous other languages. In Greek and Latin, the word strix once referred to nocturnal bird women who would feed off the blood and flesh of children. This was also the same in France. In Romanian, the term does literally mean one who has risen from the grave. It's likely these myths refer to something more akin to a blood parasite than the seductive vampires were used to. The earliest account of a suspected Strigoi came in 1656, in where we now consider modern-day Croatia. A villager began terrorizing his town. The man in question was Yuri Grando, and had died earlier that year. The legends state that Grando rose from the grave and would knock on doors around the village. Each house he visited would experience a death within the next few days. This continued for 16 years after Grando had originally died, until the villagers found a way to kill him. One night he appeared before his widowed wife, who said his corpse was gasping for air, but still maintained a sinister grin. The priest responsible for burying Grando 16 years earlier led a group of villagers on a quest to explain these disappearances. When they came across the vampire, one man tried to impale him in the heart with a wooden pole, but his skin was tough. The pole bounced off and splintered. The priest then took out his cross. Behold Jesus Christ, you vampire! Stop tormenting us! He yelled and the vampire fled. The next morning, they dug up his coffin, only to find a perfectly preserved body inside, with a smile on his face. They tried stabbing him in the heart again, only this time with a wooden stake, but they couldn't penetrate the skin. And so the priest performed an exorcism. Another villager took a saw and decapitated the vampire, noting the skin around his neck offered much less resistance. The vampire screamed out in pain and blood poured from his wound. With the vampire dead, the village could finally rest. 
After this story, there were several precautions taken and methods used by the Romanians and others to protect themselves from the Strigoi. There was a common belief that some men, particularly redheads, could return in the form of an animal and sneak into houses where they would feed off young women. In order to stop this, their coffins would be nailed shut, and in some cases they would even stake the corpse in the heart before they were buried. If they suspected someone had risen from their grave, they employed a host of methods to ensure the dead stayed dead. First, they would dig up the body, its heart removed and cut into two. A nail would then be driven into its forehead, and a clove of garlic placed under its tongue. Lastly, the body would be moved to face downwards, believing if the Strigoi ever woke, they would be sent straight down to the afterlife. There was the belief that one could become a Strigoi while still alive if certain conditions were met. They also divided the Strigoi into three main categories. A witch, a living Strigoi, and a Strigoi who had risen from the dead. Whilst on the topic of Romanian history, you have perhaps their most famous historical figure, Vlad Dracul, or Vlad Tepes. We also can't forget his nickname, Vlad the Impaler, which refers to his favourite pastime of impaling his enemies on pikes and watching as they die slowly. Some argue that Vlad the Impaler was the biggest influence for Bram Stoker's Dracula, whilst others don't believe this is true. It is interesting, however, to see the similarities in terms of name, location, and bloodlust. Some other undead European creatures include the Nordic Draugr, which can be found protecting tombs, the Balkan Dampir, which is born from the union of a male vampire and a human female, and the Albanian Lugat, which is your typical gruesome, can't stand sunlight, but enjoys flying around and seducing people into the darkness type of vampire. In Australia, according to Aboriginal myth, there existed a creature called the Yarama Yahu, a small, red, frog-like man who hid in trees. The Yarama Yahu has an extremely large head, with suckers on the end of its hands and feet. It also prefers to do most of its hunting during the day. When unsuspecting travellers decided to rest under its tree, it would jump down and drain the victim of their blood before swallowing them whole. If that wasn't weird enough, it then takes a nap and regurgitates the victim. When the person wakes, their skin has a noticeably red tint, and they are smaller than before. This process is repeated until they become a Yaramayahu. In Western Africa, you can find legends of a creature with iron teeth, long red hair, and hooks for feet. The Asan Bosam hangs from trees and attacks its victim from above, piercing their neck with its hooks and draining their blood. In the Philippines, you have the Manananggal, a hideous creature that is capable of detaching its torso from the rest of its body and sprouting bat-like wings. Much like Lomastu, the Manananggal likes to prey on pregnant women, using its elongated tongue to suck out the hearts of fetuses. Luckily, it does have an aversion to salt, garlic, and holy water. When it separates from its lower half is when the creature is most vulnerable. Rubbing crushed garlic, salt, or ash onto its lower half is thought to be lethal. The upper half then cannot rejoin the lower half and if it fails to do so by sunrise, the creature will perish. In Malaysia, you have the Panangalan, a ghostly spirit who floats through the air with her entrails hanging beneath her. Where the Panangalan differs from the Manananggal is the fact that they are living beings, a mortal woman who practices black magic, performing a ritual in a vat or bath of vinegar allowing them to take this ghostly form during the night, and return to their regular body in the morning. In China, you have the Zhongxi, reanimated corpses whose joints are so stiff they hop around, looking for victims to kill so they can absorb their life force. Like traditional vampires, they prefer to rest in dark places during the day. 
as there are so many different stories of creatures around the world, defining a vampire can get confusing. But the one recurring trait you will see is the need to consume the life force of other living creatures in order to sustain themselves. The other traits vary wildly depending on location, but in a fictional context they have been somewhat streamlined, and there are certain things we've come to expect, such as vampires fearing sunlight and having fangs they use to feed. An aversion to crucifixes, garlic and silver is also very common along with having no reflection, not being able to stand on consecrated ground, cross running water, or enter someone's home without being invited in first. In terms of what makes a vampire special, they are fast, strong, and much harder to kill than a regular person. They can also fly and compel humans and animals to serve them. So I guess we come back to the questions we asked in the beginning. Why are we obsessed with stories of vampires? And why did we see this change from repulsive undead monsters to handsome or seductive charmers? I think it comes down to our fascination or fear of mortality. Vampires essentially cheat death, or at least they're given a second life. Granted, it can also be seen as a curse. As for why vampires take on a more seductive or romantic role, 19th century fiction certainly contributed to this. John William Polidori's The Vampire, written in 1819, is considered by many as the start of vampire romance in the fantasy genre. Vampires slowly began to assume the role of the anti-hero, before Bram Stoker published his Dracula in 1897, the quintessential gothic horror featuring the most famous vampire of all. After this, we have a wave of fiction and movies where vampires are very much the anti-hero or the charismatic villain. This only further adds to the vampire appeal. They can be these terrifying monsters who want nothing more than to satisfy their thirst, or they can have human qualities, a tortured soul seeking redemption. Vampires are also loners most of the time, which is something people can relate to, as feeling alienated, misunderstood, and like we don't belong is something most of us experience at some point in our lives, especially when we're younger, which may explain why vampires are so popular in young adult fiction. Maybe you have a different take, or maybe you just like to share your favourite vampire book or movie. As I mentioned earlier, today's video has been sponsored by Blinkist. If you're like me and you enjoy learning new things, but struggle to find the time and motivation to commit to a series of long books, then this is definitely the app for you. Blinkist takes thousands of non-fiction books and condenses the key information into 15-minute segments that you can read or listen to in your own time. It's extremely easy to access on your phone, which means you can continue learning while doing the laundry and other mundane activities. They have over 12 million active users, as well as an extensive library of over 3,400 books spanning across numerous genres, from finance, self-help and politics, to history, nature and science. There is something for everyone. I've personally just finished listening to The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs, because dinosaurs are awesome. But some of you may prefer Mythology by Edith Hamilton, which is a great starting point for anyone interested in Greek and Roman mythology. The first hundred people who go to Blinkist.com slash mythology and fiction will receive unlimited access for an entire week, as well as an additional 25% discount if you decide you want a full membership. The 7 day trial is completely free and you can cancel at any time during those 7 days if you decide it's not for you, but if you enjoy reading, it certainly will be. As always, I've been your host, Mythology and Fiction Explained.